Tonight, as Brother Judah has mentioned to you, I'm beginning a new series of messages on the second coming of Christ. And I found that I have preached a series on this, on this subject already several years ago. I felt a great need to minister on it again in view of the times <laughs> and in view of the uh, acceleration of what preachers have to say on the subject these days. Most of which I am sad to say is not true. This is going to be a rather thorough series. I believe it's about 40 messages in length. So I want to I want to cover as much of this as I can. It's important to me that uh, before I I leave the world that I'm able to say the, the things that are upon my heart able to communicate them well. You heard the reading of the text Sister Annie read for us. That to those who look for Christ shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. They aren't the only ones that are going to see him. Every eye will see him, but they're the only ones that will see him come without relation to sin. Without sin means without regard to sin. That is, the next time he's coming, he's not coming to deal with sin. He's already dealt with sin. So that, that deals a death blow to the doctrine that Jesus is going to come and subdue his enemies and reign in Jerusalem. He's, he's not coming to deal with sin again. That's right. Jesus has dealt thoroughly mm -hmm. with sin, and there is no need to deal with any with it again at all, not with him. Amen. And it's important that the teaching of God's people keep them in continual remembrance of this. There's at least in Scripture at least 252 references to the second coming of Christ. That's the one, just the ones that I was able to identify. Now, because it deals with the future, the speculators and theorists have hopped on this subject. Actually, they've done a miserable job of dealing with what's going on now. Yeah, you can't trust them now. You can't, people that do not know how to properly handle the things that are going on now, you can't trust them to expound the things that are going to come. Amen, that's right. I'm going to establish tonight this is an essential doctrine that you cannot be wrong about it. Amen. You cannot. I want to establish here at first something that ought to be obvious, but I'm afraid we're living in a time when this is not quite so as obvious as it should be. that any teaching about Jesus has got to be right. You cannot be wrong about Jesus, about any facet of Jesus, about any ministry of Jesus, about anything Jesus said, anything Jesus did, anything he's going to do, anything he's doing. You can't be wrong about it. You can't have a private opinion about it. We're dealing with a record God has given of his son, it's precise, God has said what he wants known about his son, and woe to that person who clouds this to the saints. Yes, amen. And a lot of people have done this. Yes. Amen. They just, uh, they've taken this matter of free will a bit too far. Yes. They felt at liberty to impose upon the doctrine of Christ some of their own ideas. And this is not going to be overlooked. Amen. God is not going to just brush this aside. 
Say, well, you had a right to your opinion. No, you don't. When it comes to Jesus, you do not have a right to your opinion. Amen. If you don't know about this truth, then just keep quiet about it. Yeah. Don't talk about it at all. Now I want to uh, take a moment and ponder how Jesus is declared to us, how he's brought up. Matthew begins his gospel by saying, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ. Notice how you automatically, you're drawn away. Right. You're drawn to Christ. You think about humanity, you're drawn, you're drawn to Christ right away. Mark starts his gospel by saying, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. I'm showing here that this is telling you that you can't be wrong about Jesus. You, you, if people say, this is Jesus, Jesus prefers to be around sinners. So you had better be right about this. Yes, right. Amen. Mm -hmm. You think God Almighty is going to overlook how people have represented his son? Do you think he loves the world that much? That he's going to overlook how they corrupted what he has said about his son? He's not. See, there's no fear of God in the contemporary church. There's no fear of God. They've, they've preached a familiarity with God that is unwarranted. Yes. They've misrepresented Christ, miserably have misrepresented him, his life and his death and his resurrection and his coming again, and God is not going to overlook it. Amen. He has said whoever adds to the words of the prophecy of this book, He's going to get the plagues that are written in it. Yeah. God's going to impose them on him. And I'll blot his name out of the book of life. I, don't, I know none of you do this, but you may be tempted sometime to tamper with the doctrine of Christ. You do so at the jeopardy of hell, fire, and damnation. Amen. Why? Why? Because your salvation hinges on a proper understanding of Jesus. Faith can't rest in a figment of the imagination. Amen. And you're saved by faith. Paul referred to 2 Corinthians 11, 10. The truth of Christ. I just like the phrase. The truth of Christ. Galatians 6, 2 refers to the law of Christ. So you talk about law, it's of Christ. It's the law of love, as he told you. And the cross of Christ, you talk about death, about the loss of life, the premier loss of life is that of Christ. Cross of Christ, the blood of Christ. See how he's, he's, it's like a magnifying glass. He's bringing it right down on Christ. The mystery of Christ. And you may think that, well, it's really plain about Christ. No, it's not really plain. Mm -hmm. yeah. You grow it, it clears up to you. That you yeah. tell me if you, the things you know of Christ now, you haven't known for like all your life. Amen. Why haven't you? It's a mystery of Christ. Yeah. God has made a revelation of Christ so that if you don't want to know it, you cannot see it. He's made a revelation of Christ. If you haven't fled to him for, re for refuge, you can't see it. It's a mystery of Christ. And then there's the riches of Christ. If you want something from God, it comes through Christ. All the riches are through Christ. He talks about the love of Christ in Ephesians 3.19. And the fullness of Christ in Ephesians 4.13. And the Spirit of Christ in Philippians 1.19. See, he's, fo he's focusing on Christ. Everything hinges on Christ. Christ, Jesus is his earthly identity. It his, emphasizes his manhood. Christ emphasizes his mission and the work he was given to do. And Lord emphasizes his position and exaltation where he is. Lord Jesus Christ. You've got to be right about all all of those things. And when it comes to what's said of Christ, God takes it to himself. 
John refers to it in 1 John 5, 10 and 11 as the record God has given of his son. All right, so when anything, anything has to do with the teaching about Christ, God has given that record. Yes. And it, if you believe that record, you have eternal life. Mm -hmm. That's how critical the record is. Yeah, amen. If you don't believe the record, I mean, you don't have eternal life. It's, not, it's just not just about this at all. You say, I believe in Jesus with all my heart, whatever that means. I say, whatever that means. You've got to get down to this point. You believe what God said about Christ. And that's what we're going to be looking into what God has said about his coming. And the day of judgment is called the day of Christ. Christ is going to have his day. <laughs> and all those people that opposed him, the day of Christ is coming. Amen. He's going to have his day. Yes. That's right. Amen. People that haven't preached what he said to preach, mm -hmm. Jesus is going to have his day. Yes. Uh -huh. People who have believed on him and have done what he said and have been mocked by the world, Jesus is going to have his day. Uh -huh. The day of Jesus is going to come. People have wondered and twisted and perverted the doctrine of Christ's coming and attached to it all kind of folklore. Jesus is going to have his day. Amen. And when he does, he's going to be both a lamb, lion and a lamb. Yes. Uh -huh. To those who corrupted, lion. Yes. To those who accepted, lamb. Amen. But he's going to have his day, the day of Christ. Three times is reference to that. Philippians 1.10, Philippians 2.16, and 2 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. The day of Christ. That's when, on the day of Christ, nobody will have any significance but Christ. Amen. He's going to be like the one who fills the entire page. Everybody's attention is going to be on him. Nobody's going to be thinking about anybody but him. Amen. All thinking about the devil's going to terminate that day. Amen. All thinking about self's going to terminate on that day. Amen. Everybody's going to be thinking about Christ. Some are going to be shaking and trembling, and some are going to be shouting and rejoicing. Amen. That's the way the coming of the Lord's going to be. Yeah. Now, you've got to prepare for it now, and to prepare for it properly, you've got to understand it correctly. Yeah. Now let's look at the perspective of our text. Our text, Hebrews 9.28, says Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin. See, he's not going to be dealing with sin. Unto salvation. Now this perspective is associated with necessity. I want to take a moment to comment on that salvation depends on this uh, necessity mm -hmm. Hebrews 9 16 and 17 just previous to this text said mm -hmm. where a testament is there must of necessity yes. be the death of the testator for the testament is a force after men are dead yeah. otherwise it is of no strength at all, while the testator liveth. So, see, we're dealing with we're dealing with a realm that has the heading necessity mm -hmm. yes. over the top of it. In Hebrews nine twenty three, therefore, it was necessary that the items that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but with the heavenly things themselves, with better sacrifices than these, it was necessary it was essential that Jesus go back to heaven he had to get heaven ready for us to come there had been insurrection in heaven the old serpent and his angels had been cast out there had been accusations made in heaven against the saints by Satan as is illustrated in the book of Job and the heavens had to be cleansed and purified from all these contaminants. 
He had to go back to heaven. See, I'm showing that this doctrine is tied in with something that's necessary. Salvation depends upon Christ's present intercession. He appearing, is now appearing, verse 26 says, he is appearing in the presence of God for us, and if he wasn't, we wouldn't stand a chance of his death counting for us. The effectiveness of Christ's death isn't owing just to the fact that it occurred. It's that Christ is now at the right hand of God interceding on the basis of that death. See, it's a necessary thing. And salvation depends upon Jesus having put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. <coughs> it was 9.26. <coughs> Then you mentioned the coming of the Lord. See, so it's, it's associated with necessary, essential things. Salvation depends on Jesus returning without sin. Salvation is not done till Jesus returns, not to deal with sin. The finished work of Christ, that phrase isn't in the Bible. Just to clarify things. When Jesus said it is finished, he was referring to the work he was to do on earth. He finished it. He's not coming back to start it up again. He's done working in this world in person. Now, I know that people teach he's going to come back and reign in Jerusalem, but they're just wrong, that's all. He's finished. His earthly work is finished. Next time he comes back, the heavens and the earth are going to pass away. Amen. That's it. It's, it's done Amen. completely and without fail. So a proper view of salvation cannot be held if any of these dear doctrines are distorted. If there's any distortion of Christ's first appearance to put away sin, or any distortion of Christ's present appearance in heaven, interceding for us, or any distortion of his appearing again without sin, salvation falls to the ground. Salvation depends on these three pillars. You've got to be right about them. You cannot be wrong about them. Woe to the people that developed amillennialism. They're in for a bad time. When Jesus comes again, woe to those who concocted premillennialism. It, it distorted the doctrine of Christ. You may say, we ought to love him. Well, I'm not so sure that's true. I'm not about to take someone's word for it either. I don't think God's given men the right to have a different view of Christ's coming or postmillennialism. Or preterism. There's a different one. Premillennial says Christ is going to come back, secretly rapture the church, then come back again, set up his kingdom on earth, and there'll be a thousand years where people will live for hundreds of years, and everyone will be able to go to Jerusalem and see him personally. And this is the predominant teaching of our day. Postmillennialism says, that there'll be a thousand years of gospel, a thousand years when the knowledge of the Lord is to cover the earth, the waters cover the sea, and after that, the Lord will come. Well, that actually is pretty, pretty true. Our millennialism says Jesus Christ, we're in the kingdom right now. And preterism says Jesus has already come back. And the resurrection has already occurred. Oh well, yeah, this is this is taught. It's a growing it's a growing doctrine. It's a growing doctrine. It may be absurd to you, but let me tell you, let me tell you, it's, it's picking up speed. Now, what I'm saying is, God's going to deal with these doctrines. God's going to be found true and every man a liar. Those who concocted this doctrine are going to be shown to be liars. And those who accepted them are all going to be shown to be deceived. Amen. What their eternal destiny is going to be, God will settle it. But it does, looks pretty gloomy at this point. Amen. I'm really upset 
with men who think they can tamper with the doctrine of Scripture and apply their pygmy minds to the comprehension of what God has said. <clears throat> now here we talk about <clears throat> the coming of the Lord. We're dealing with a promise. This is a, this is a promise. Now we're in the promissory aspect of salvation. And it's by the promises that we become partakers of the divine nature. So you can't foul up the promises. <laughs> Now, some people think the promise is when God's going to move all the wealth from the wealthy, wicked, to the godly. And that mega church and TV media ministers tell us that this is about to occur, a great shift of wealth from the wicked to the righteous. Now, I'm very fearful of that, uh, that kind of doctrine. That's not how it's represented in Scripture. Even stewards that have legitimate wealth are going to have to give it back to Christ. Huh? Even those who have legitimate wealth, when Jesus comes, they're going to give it back to him because they just it was borrowed for a while. The promissory aspect of salvation. See, this salvation, you taste of it here and now, but only in its initial stage. This is just the beginning. This is not the whole thing. And just to convince you this is the case, you've got to consider your body. It is not saved. It belongs to Jesus. Jesus has purchased it, and it's a member of Christ, but it's not saved yet. So that means there's something else that's got to happen before we are all saved. And their promises, now they come in, the promises come in. You know, God holds out to you so that by these you become partakers of the divine nature. You're no more godly than you're convinced of the truth of the promises. Amen. Now here Jesus said to his disciples the night of his betrayal. He didn't let much of that night pass till he said, I will come again. I will come again. I will. Come again. Why will you come back? I will come again and take you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. So he's not coming back so he will be where we are. He's coming back so we will be where he is. Amen. That's what he said. That's right. Jesus said, now he's, this is the promissory aspect. Six times Jesus said this. He spoke of men seeing the Son of Man coming. Six times he said they're going to see him. He didn't say hovering. Yeah, that's right. yeah. He didn't know. I'm sorry. He didn't say they'll see him hovering. He doesn't say he'll sneak in, take the church out. He snuck in the first time. He's not sneaking in the second time. Amen. First time he came, nobody knew who he was. Second time he comes, everybody's going to know who he is. You will see it. Revelation 1 says, and 8 says, every eye shall see him, and they that pierced him shall see him. See, it could be, which means the resurrection will occur before. Yes. It'll, be, it'll be like instant. It's not going to be like a couple of years pass. It's going to be all instant, but there's going to be a sequence. There's even, in instant things, there's even a sequence. If you take a, an explosion of something, and you magnify the process, even though it looks like it happened instantly, it's just a sequence that right. takes place in it. Uh -huh. And it's going to take, when Jesus comes, there's going to be a certain uh, sequence. The dead will be raised. Amen. Everybody will be changed. They're going to all together, the human race together in the aggregate, uh -huh. from Adam to the end of the world, are all going to see him on his way. See him coming. Amen. That's what it says. They shall see the Son of Man Amen. coming. Yes. Amen. <laughs> and it won't be able to change. Yes. Won't be able to alter your conduct. Yes. If you're out of oil, <laughs> you're out of, that's it. That's right. If you got oil, you're in. That's Amen. it. Amen. 
If when he comes, you're impure forever. You're locked in that state. If he comes and you're pure, you're forever locked in that state. You'll see him coming. Everybody will know it. I, I don't think this is related at this point to time. I don't know how you could explain this in terms of hours and minutes and all this sort of thing. But they'll see him coming. He'll stand up in the glory. He'll first, he'll hear an angel say, thrust in your sickle. The harvest has come. He'll stand up. He'll commence his journey, all happening in a flash of an instant of time, commence his journey back to glory, and every day I'll see him coming, and everyone's going to know, oh, I should have trusted him. Be too late. Because I trusted him, thank God. You'll never be happier. <laughs> Yeah, when you see him, see the Son of Man coming. You see him coming. Six times in the Revelation, Jesus said, Behold, I come. Six times, I come. I'm coming back. Don't get lulled. Listen, we got brethren that have been with us that have dropped off the deep end and went back to the world. There's not many of them, but there's too many to suit me. They forgot that he's coming. But Jesus hasn't forgot it. God hasn't forgotten it. He's coming. The old I come. Now he, in the epistles, this is taught over and over. 2 Thessalonians 1.10 says, He shall come. That's a promise now. May not look like it, He shall come. You may get caught up in a lot of busyness, you know, and things you got to do. He shall come. Amen. Amen. Hebrews 10.37 says, He that shall come will come and will not tarry. So it looks like he's holding off a little now, but... He shall come and will not tarry. Uh -huh. Second Peter 3.10 says, He will come as a thief in the night. There won't be bells and whistles of blowing. Going to interrupt yes. life just like the flood interrupted life in Noah's day. They were eating, drinking, planting, marrying, giving in marriage, and things are just going along, and all of a sudden, here come the flood. That's how it's going to be when Jesus comes, see? Be just like an ordinary day. Yeah. People doing this and doing that. Two, two people may be working in the field, you know. One will be taken, the other left. Is that the rapture? No, the ones left are the wicked. Yeah. Uh -huh. Amen. Not the righteous. Yeah. Come on. Who was taken when the said when the flood came and took them all away? Who was it exactly that was taken away? Noah? Yes, the rest of the people were taken away. Jesus said that gave a parable of the wheat and the tares. He told them that the end in the end he'll send forth his angels and first they'll gather out the tares. Now, how exactly does that fit in the rapture? nonsense. How does that, how exactly does that fit in there? Is that a mistranslation or something like that? Well, even the modern translations can't get around it. Gather the tares out first. Why? Because they're the ones that defile the field. The field belonged to God. The field was made for wheat. And when Jesus comes back, he'll dispatch the angels. First, let's cleanse the field out here first. Get those tares out. Don't throw them in the garbage yet. The great eternal garbage can. We're not going to fill it yet. I'm going to prove before an assembled universe that it's right for me to send these people to hell. Everybody's going to know it. Nobody's going to contest it. Some people are going to be related to some of these people. But they aren't going to be crying. Amen. God's going to show us righteous, see. Mm -hmm. Going to come as a thief in the night. 
And then we are told to maintain our lives until the Lord come. Who will discern the thoughts and intents of the heart and give to every man and give and reward every man according as his works shall be. Praise. And then shall every man have praise from God. <coughs> First Corinthians 4 or 5. So if you're not being praised right now, just hold on. You're going to be. Those that are faithful, people laugh at you maybe now, make fun of you. Say, oh, I don't believe that kind of stuff. I don't believe in God anymore. Well, you will. Right. This isn't over. It's not over yet. Amen. Not over yet. Again, 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 says, The Lord himself, I like, the Lord himself shall descend from heaven. Now, those that corrupt this doctrine say he's going to just hover over the earth. He's going to hover over the earth. That's not what it says. He's going to gather them. The saints are going to meet him in the air. There will be a whole generation that doesn't die the normal way. Millions, billions of people that won't die the normal way. They'll just be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised. We were alive and remain shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. It's all going to happen. When he descends from heaven. And he, he instituted the Lord's table. He said, Paul give us the doctor now. He says, often you do this, you show or declare the Lord's death till he come. See, we're doing this till he Amen. till he come. Is the Lord's Supper going to be in heaven? I don't know. It's not going to be like it is here, if it is. It would be on a different, different on a more exalted basis, but we take this till he come. Mm -hmm. Then we're not going to be have to remember him anymore. Yes. We'll, be with him. Yes. <laughs> we'll be with him. Here we're, there's a sense which we're not with him. We're with him in spirit and so forth, but it's not the final state. Mm -hmm. We're going to be actually with him never to leave him, and then so there's not going to be a need to remember like we do, at least not like we do here. And his appearing eight times in the Apostles' Doctrine, there's reference to his appearing eight times. Keep this commandment until his appearing. And several other such verses. And as we pray tonight... See, this is all a promissory. I didn't want to cloud the fact this is all promissory in nature is what was going to happen. And it's got to, this, this must be a powerful incentive in your life. Amen. You can't sweep this under the rug and say, I don't understand it. You, you can't do that. This is what you've got to know this and look forward to this. This is necessary. It'll help you to keep clean. I can tell you that if there's something you're about to do and you, you're not quite sure whether you want to do it or not, you ask yourself, do I want to be found doing this when Jesus comes? And you will never have a wrong answer. You'll always know the answer. You will say, well, I'm not sure. You'll always know. Just try it and see. You'll always know the answer. And the grace of God, of course, teaches us effectively mm -hmm. yeah. to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts as to reject them. Uh -huh. Ungodliness and worldly lusts, these are like flaming arrows, fiery darts that are thrown. You, you repel them, you reject them. And to live righteously and godly in this present world, mm -hmm. looking See, you can't really, you can't really deny ungodliness and worldly lust if you're not looking. Amen. That's right. That's not that's not fool anybody yeah, about this. Uh, uh. <laughs> you can't. Some of you just try, but just try to gut it out, you know, and you stop doing this and stop doing that, and they just say, oh. And so we've got all kind of recovery programs that teach people now. I am, I was, I am an alcoholic. <laughs> I always will be an alcoholic. I've tried, my life is out of control. 
Well, it better get in control. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. If your life is out of control, you can't. There's no excuse for it. The grace of God teaches you to control it. Amen. And you control it by looking yes. for the blessed, glorious, and blessed appearance of a great God and Savior. That's quite a statement about Jesus, the great God and Savior. See, people debate, is Jesus God? See, these people, don't treat them like they're smart. Don't treat them like they're intelligent because they're not. The great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ, that's what he's called. The grace teaches us to shape our lives for that appearing. Looking here means a joyful. It's not a foreboding looking, oh no, oh, I hope it doesn't happen one today. There used to be an old hillbilly gospel song, and there are special kind of songs, hillbilly songs, there are special kind of songs, and it says, wait a little longer, sweet Jesus. Yeah, I'm not singing that song. Oh well, yeah, it was a popular song. There's a lot of people lost in sin. Wait a little longer until we can bring them all in. The objective is to get in yourself. That's the objective. As I minister on this theme of the uh, (coughs) second coming of Christ, (coughs) I'm doing so with an acute awareness of its essentiality. You've got to see it right. And I'll do my best to avoid any kind of novel approach or one that tends to minister questions. I'll try it, I'm endeavoring to minister so that there's answers, not questions. My aim is to have your thinking molded by the truth of his promise coming. That if you can see it right, it corrects a lot of things that are otherwise very, very difficult to correct. There are some people that have learned to live with certain sins and weaknesses and they're told this is the way you were brought up you know this is the environment this is the way you were born and so forth but grace will correct you on that (laughs) it'll say yes this is what you were you were unworthy yes this is what you were you were a blasphemer and injurious yes this is what you were but God has taken the past away. Amen. Why? Because he wants you to be ready. Amen. This isn't just a technical point with God. This is when Jesus comes back, he's going to get his bride. Yes. And so God has spread a big table, the table of salvation. Yes. He's put a lot of stuff on it. And that for the dessert. Yes. We got the coming of the Lord served up in a beautiful golden goblet. Yes, amen. It says, take this in. Think about this often. When you're disappointed, think about this. When you're discouraged, think about this. When you're opposed, think about this. Yes. When you feel weak, think about this. Think about it. Yes. The day of the Lord will come. Amen. You're not going to be able to predict it. You're not going to be, so, which means it could be any time. So I don't see any evidence. It could be then. It could be now. And live in prospect of that coming. I'm going to affirm that there isn't anything that's promised to the saints of God that doesn't hinge on this on this coming. Your eternal state hinges on this on this coming. And I, I would ask for your prayers during this time because uh, I want to avoid any kind of bypaths or, you know, excursions into the unknown and all this kind of thing. The coming of the Lord, I trust that it was, you've seen, at least in part, the need, the criticality of this teaching, the need for proper teaching on it. All I can give you is what I've seen. But I do endeavor by the grace of God to do that. Tonight, Brother Ricky has our exhortation.